Morning. Um, my name is Jorina Hickey and I'm here from the Beacon Hospital, as Mena said, um, to talk to you about our experience using a line or T <coughs> for cranial SRS and uh, I'll be discussing whether we find it an accurate and reliable method. So just to tell you a bit about the Beacon uh, Hospital, uh, we had our first treatment in 2007 and we're a two Lenac department with OBI or PM4 DCT and a line or T and we have a well established Sabre and SRS programme. Um, to focus on our SRS program specifically, uh, we've treated approximately 770 patients um, since 2007, the majority of which are brain meths. And until 2014, uh, we were using the Varian optical guidance platform, which has a frame solution or a um, mouth block <laughs> solution where uh, like a dental mold is placed in the patient's mouth. And uh, there's four infrared markers on the platform there just above the patient's face and that's uh, tracked by an infrared camera and the frame solution has a similar idea with infrared markers on the frame and due to the end of support in 2014 we moved to a line RT um, so since then we've treated 170 treatments um, and it's a very well tolerated uh, uh, treatment by the patients uh, when we switched from OGP to vision RT uh, we were very um, eager to use the same tolerances, so we have a one mil PTV and um, uh, a one, one mil uh, translation and 0.3 degree rotation uh, tolerance during treatment, uh, at which point we put the patient back in. Um, and our cone beam CT is our gold standard for imaging and we use a line RT for setup and monitoring. So just to get to the bones of the talk, um, the factors affecting accuracy in a line or T are kind of twofold. There's the user dependent factors um, at CT sim and immobilization. Uh, the ROI selection is user dependent and uh, at treatment setup you have to be very cautious with your treatment is what we found, uh, or with your setup. And then the limitations of the system itself and uh, as physicists we all know that all systems have limitations and you just have to learn how to deal with them. So uh, again, the ROI can be a problem and the noise effect during cone beam CT and during gantry motion is just um, another issue that you kind of need to learn how to get around. So to talk about CT sim and immobilization, uh, we use the Macromedics DSPS open face mask <coughs> and um, there's an occipital part um, which the patient's head is placed into and that's for immobilizing the back of the head and to kind of create a bit of stability around the back of the neck. Um, and then there's a, an open face part that's added on afterwards. Um, we've, we worked closely with Macromedics when we first got the system um, and they suggested that to just have that two finger space between the bottom of the mask and the plate and that's to ensure that the patient doesn't go too deep into the mask. The deeper the patient is in the mask, the smaller the ROI will be and uh, I'll get to why we don't want a small ROI. Um, <clears throat> then also um, we were having some trouble with pitch and uh, we spoke to Macromedics and Vision RT about it and uh, we were advised um, to maybe try using this bite mark inside in the top part of the mask um, which kind of focuses the patient while the mask is, is being put on to just keep their chin down and also during treatment um, so we found that that's useful and then also with Macromedics um, recently to, they're working on a solution of um, maybe for patients who can't put their chin down due to mobility issues, um, that uh, we could maybe raise the occipital part up um, on a tilt. So I've mentioned chin down there a couple of times and uh, why we find that it's so important for um, SRS is that you've got three cameras and the, at the foot of the bed, that's kind of, if the patient's head is up, it's just looking up the patient's nostrils and just at their chin. Uh, so if you can get it down as much as possible, it gives the ROI more to see, or the cameras more to see more of the ROI. Um, so the ROI selection, um, the way that we do it, uh, the, the, we import the DICOM into, the, into a line RT from the treatment plan and the structures as well. And uh, we have started um, adding the mask in on the planning system. Um, just so that the therapist can see the outline of the mask um, because if you, if you overlap the ROI with the mask you, you end up with some tilt and noise issues as well. Um, and over time we've kind of found um, ourselves that the best way to draw the ROI is to exclude the cheeks and that's because we had some, uh, again we've had some pitch issues and uh, one day one of my <coughs> colleagues um, 
just switched between a patient where we were having a lot of issues and you could see when the cheeks were in and the cheeks were out, we were getting a one degree pitch on the patient. So um, I know you're cutting out some of the ROI there, but then we're very cautious to get as far back and as high up. Um, so like it says there, uh, to exclude the cheeks and use the frontal bones. And then we've had some patients come with glittery makeup on or false eyelashes and that can cause havoc. Uh, with noise issues and one of the ways to combat that aside from asking the patient not to do that is um, you can remove the eyes from the ROI but again that's the reducing the size um, so that can just to be aware that if you reduce the size that it can cause problems later on in the treatment. Um, we don't have a six degree of freedom couch so we use the head adjuster um, which is handy it has the three knobs at the top for yaw pitch and roll um, so what we do is we attach that to the couch and our therapists are very cautious to um, level that out to zero in the roll and pitch direction before we put the patient on the bed. And then, oh, this is supposed to be a movie. I should have checked that it works and it doesn't, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll just talk about this. <laughs> um, this is supposed to be a movie that shows how we set up the patient. So the therapists are cautious to, to get the patient in the occipital part of the mask, they slowly set the patient up, watching a line or two, watching the deltas, and we level them out to as close to zero as possible prior to putting on the top part of the mask. And that's to get the pitch and roll as correct as possible. And then once um, the mask is on, then we fine tune using the head adjuster. And then finally capture a, um, an a line or two reference, um, which we then use for cone beam CT. Um, at cone beam CT, because the OBI arms are out and the gantry is moving, uh, you can get a lot of noise issues where you kind of, to be honest, have no idea whether the patient has moved or not, or is moving. It looks like the patient's moving and they're not. Uh, this is due to the fact we think that the, these are the, the three views from the camera, and as the gantry goes around with the arms out, it's losing full view of the patient at different times. Um, so. The way we've decided to deal with this is we just note the deltas before and after um, and it, then if the patient has moved we can be happy um, and we have a tolerance on that. Um, so this graph here just shows the um, frequency of magnitude of difference in deltas pre and post cone beam. Um, that's for 78 treatments. This is a bit of a study that I've done that will keep popping up. Um, like I said, we've treated 170 treatments and this is a study of 78 patients. Um, and the majority of our patients, as you can see in the rotation and translational direction, have um, less than 0.3 mo uh, motion during cone beam CT. Um, but we have had to re cone beam five patients of that 78 because they moved during the cone beam or uh, during matching. But for the most part, we find that our patients are very stable in the mask. We like to note it still, um, just because we like to know for sure. Um, when we're matching online, um, I suppose essentially what we're doing is checking that a line RT is agreeing with our cone beam CT bony match and um, what we've found is that we have less than two millimeters um, in the vert and lat shifts for the majority of our patients, about 98%, and um, so the setup is really good but we do have about 18% uh, of, of our patients have a long shift of greater than two mils and we kind of see that as a uh, an indication that we're going to have some pitch issues. Um, our couch rotations are very good as well, you can see them there. Um, but because we have the head adjuster, we have to manually correct for this, and because we manually correct, we recomb beam. Um, and if we didn't correct for that, I think I just want to go through what the effect of not correcting for that pitch would be. You end up with the GTV possibly outside the PTV when you've got a one mil margin. Um, so it's very important to, to know your margins and to know what kind of pitch and roll you're going to allow. Um, and we, we think that one of the reasons that we have this issue with pitch, with pitch predo predominantly is this first image here on my side is a speckle image of a phantom um, and the camera at the bottom of the bed. And um, it's set up as if it's like a temporal, fairly central and very close to the ROI. And as you can see, um, we wouldn't really find much pitch issues with that. And then going over to the other image, that's um, set up as if it's a very post-cerebellum treatment and the patient's, patient, the phantom's chin is well back. And um, the camera at the bottom of the bed there is seeing nothing. So 
we think that that's the reason that we see so many pitch issues and um, we've discussed this with Align RC a lot and um, I think in the most recent upgrade this problem is supposed to be eliminated. Um, however, last week we did have a patient and now this lady was fairly, um, I suppose, kind of a, a difficult patient to treat. She had mobility issues, her neck, she couldn't move her neck so she couldn't get her chin down at all. And, um, that's what the bottom of the cam the bed was see the camera at the bottom of the bed was seeing. So really just looking up her nostrils and, and we had a 1.3 degree pitch on her, um, which we corrected for. Um, so in our experience we've found that by location um, the majority of um, the pitch is pre more prevalent in the cerebellum and um, some other areas as well. And then for the role, it's again the cerebellum is where we see the most, uh, the most, pitch, the most role um, that we have to apply. But role seems to be a little bit less of a problem. Um, and again, we, we think that that's because of the distance from the, from the ROI. So it's just something to be cautious of, I suppose. Um, then another limitation that, again, uh, Align RT has a tidy little solution to is um, editing the thresholds during treatment if you're, if you're having an arc uh, passing the, the, the patient's face and causing a shadow. And what, it, what happens is that it, once the shadow comes on the patient's face, it appears that the patient has moved. Um, so what we do is we go back to zero or 180 and um, remove the shadow. And then if the patient has moved, we put them back in tolerance. And um, if they haven't, we adjust the threshold um, for, for, for the gate. And, um, to about the noise that we were seeing and then we're happy to proceed we can re-enable the gate and um, if we see anything more than that we beam off and check again so um again just to go through those 78 patients what we've found is that um the camera noise is most prevalent again the further away from the roi you are um, our feeling would be that patients with smaller very small faces um tend to have more noise as well uh, we don't really have enough data to show that um, because so few of our patients have what we would class as a very small face. Um, and then we've also found that the larger couch kick off zero, so heading towards 270 and 90, you see a lot more noise. Um, so you can see there again the cerebellum, um, so the further away you are from the ROI, uh, you get a lot more camera noise and um, this just shows that um, if you look at the, the brown bar, um, that shows that I suppose for the, for the cerebellum, you end up having to edit the threshold on more couch kicks, um, so it's more prevalent. And again, just to remind you, we think that this is the reason. It's because the patient is higher up on the bed and uh, the camera at the bottom of the bed is seeing less. So to summarize, um, the user-dependent factors um, are, happen at CT stim and immobilization. Our solution that we, were, we found uh, mitigates this is to get the chin down and to have the bite mark in. Um, at the ROI selection we exclude the cheeks and remove the eyes if the patient is blinking or has false eyelashes or anything. Um, and at treatment setup uh, we are careful to minimise the Align RT data prior to putting on the top part of the mask. And then for the Align RT limitations, um, to capture the or to note the deltas before and after combium CT to mitigate uh, so that you'll know whether your patient has moved or not. Um, the ROI is really about maximising the size um, and the noise during gantry motion is that Align RT has provided a solution which is to just edit the thresholds. Um, so in conclusion, Align RT is very um, reliable and accurate and we are very happy with it as a real-time monitor um, but our cone beam CT still remains our uh, gold standard for imaging. Um, it's a very patient-friendly um, system we you know uh, the lady I was talking about earlier on she wouldn't go into an MRI and uh, she stayed in the mask happily for the for the treatment so it's quite nice and that's the end of the talk